atomic models timeline from 460 BCE to 1932. Introducing the timeline, BCE stands for before the common era or before the Christian era. Sometimes it's referred to as BC, before Christ or before the birth of Jesus Christ. 700 down to 600 is the 7th century, then 600 down to 500 is the 6th century, and then all the way down from 100 to 0 is the 1st century. The new era began from 0 to 100, and that's the 1st century. 2nd century is 100 to 200, and 3rd is 200 to 300. And you can see we're now in the 2000 to 2100. So we're in the 21st century now. We're going to look at the Greek philosophers and the scientists from Democritus to James Chadwick. Lysippus and Democritus in the 5th century BCE. Lysippus was the teacher and Democritus was the student. Both believed that a piece of matter like wood for example, if you cut it to half and half again, half again, half again, until it becomes so small that you cannot cut it anymore. Democritus thought that matter was made up of millions of tiny, uncuttable or indivisible pieces of that same matter, which they called atomos, meaning uncuttable or indivisible. Atomos is what we call atom today. They did not carry out experiments to justify their hypothesis. Aristotle, Greek philosopher, 335 BCE. Aristotle proposed that matter was made up of combinations of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. No experiments were carried out to justify their hypothesis. They did disagree with uh, Democritus uh, in that they did not believe in atomos. The third one is in the 1773, 16th century, Antonia Lavoisier, uh, is a French chemist. He stated the law of conservation of mass, which is that the total mass of reactant equal to total mass of products in a chemical reaction. The total mass of a chemical reaction will remain constant. Stoichiometry is founded on the law of conservation of mass. and that led to the insight that the relationship among quantities of reactants and products typically form a ratio of positive integer. Here's the positive integer here. There's a ratio here, and this is a stoichiometric ratio. We are burning methane with oxygen to give carbon dioxide and water. So one mole of methane plus two mole of oxygen gas gives one mole of carbon dioxide plus two mole of water. So the one to two to one to two are the stoichiometric ratio. And hence the total mass of the reactant equals to the total mass of the product. Number four, the next big one is the is in 1794 by French chemist Joseph Louis Prost. And he gave us Prost law, law of definite proportion. In this law, it states that chemical compounds always combine in constant proportions, forms the basis of stoichiometry. Again, you can see A, little a, capital A, plus little b, capital B, will give you little c, capital C, plus little d, capital D. A, B, C, and D, the little ones, are what we call coefficient in maths. That's the number in front of a reactant or product. But in chemistry, they are called stoichiometric ratio or moles. So here, again, the same combustion of methane. We got one for little a, two for little b, one for little c, and two for little d. Again, so again, it's talking about the formation of stoichiometric ratio which led to the law of conservation of mass. So that's another big justification for the law of conservation of mass. The fifth one we're going to look at is John Dalton, an English chemist in 1803. This is called Dalton model of atom. Dalton's law, the law of multiple proportions, 
states that if two elements can combine to form a number of different compounds, the ratio of the masses of the two elements in their various compounds will be represented by a small whole number positive integer. For instance, if you got two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, combining together to form water, and the ratio of those two elements in water is 2 to 1, whole number. Like in hydrogen peroxide here, the ratio is 2 to 2, which is 1 to 1. In nitrogen and oxygen here, you form N2O, the ratio is 2 to 1, and O, the ratio is 1 to 1. There's one there, there's one there. N, O2, the ratio is 1 to 2. So we can see a whole positive integer here. And that's what this is saying. Iron and oxygen will form iron oxide ratio 1 to 1, or iron 3 oxide, which is 2 to 3 ratio. So Dalton then went on to say that um, elements are made up of tiny particles called atoms, and that atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. Atoms of different elements are differ in size, mass, and other properties. Atom of hydrogen will be different from atom of nitrogen. Every element is made up of their own atom. This is what this is saying. So, atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. So that means you cannot go beyond an atom. Atom is the smallest unit you can get. Atom of different elements combine to form compounds in a simple whole number ratio. We just talked about that from the Proust law. And atom combine, separate, and rearrange in a chemical reaction. In 1891, an Irish physicist, George Johnstone Stoney, he is most famous for introducing the term electron as the fundamental unit of electricity. At this point, electron has not been discovered yet. In 1874, he introduced the concept, though not the word, initially naming it electron. The next person we're going to look at is Sir Joseph John Thomson, J.J. Thomson, the British physicist. In 1897, he discovered electron, which he called corpuscles, from a scattered ray tube experiment. This one here. The corpuscle name was replaced with electron by the scientific community. Thompson's illustration of the Crookes tube, by which he observed the deflection of cathode ray by an electric field, and later measured their mass to charge ratio. Cathode rays were emitted from the cathode C, passed through slit A and B, and then through the electric field generated between the plates D and E, finally impacted the surface of the far end. If this plate was positive here, the ray will be deflected towards the left here. And if the ray was positive here, the ray will be deflected towards the right here. As the cathode ray particles of matter carried an electric charge, which was deflected by an electric force, as if they were negatively charged by the ray, also deflected by a magnetic force, as if they were negatively charged by the rays. He concluded that they both are charged of negative electricity carried by the particle of matter. So his conclusion was that the cathode ray were a negative charge. In 1904, before the discovery of atomic nucleus, Thompson proposed the plum pudding model. The existence of protons and neutrons were unknown then. Electron was negatively charged, as he discovered. Particles inside atoms was known now. Atoms are neutral. Atoms have no net electric charge. The plum pudding model has electron surrounded by a volume of positive charge, like negatively charged plums embedded in a positively charged pudding. If you think of that as a cookie, and the cookie is a pudding, and inside the cookies are these chocolate chips here, there's chocolate, and they are the plum, and the plums are the electrons. But the pudding is the spread positive charge, so everywhere is positive charge. So bringing that up, positive charge will be weak, because it's evenly spread everywhere. 
and so you got positive charge everywhere and also you got the electron here but these are weak positive charge so the next person we look at is Ernest Rutherford New Zealand physicist 1911 nuclear model or Rutherford model in 1905 Ernest Rutherford performed an experiment to test the plum pudding model. Ernest was a student of J.J. Thompson. The experiment was carried out by his student Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden. They directed a beam of alpha particle helium nucleus at a very thin gold foil suspended in a vacuum. Here's the alpha source, the alpha particle, the gold foil. Using the scintillation method able to measure the scattering pattern by the use of a zinc sulfide fluorescent screen. That's the scintillation screen. This is the expected result and this is what they got. The proposed alpha particle bounced off the metal foil in all directions. Some bounced back at the source. This should have been impossible according to Thompson's model because the positive charge is spread out so therefore the alpha particle could be able to pass through because the positive is weak. The particle had entered an electrostatic force greater than the Thompson's model predicted. Only a small fraction of the alpha particle were deflected by more than 90 degrees. Most flew straight through the foil with no or little deflection. Rutherford concluded that the center of the foil atom is a tiny positive charge and that most of the atom's volume was an empty space and that the electrons is surrounding the nucleus. The next one to look at is Niels Bohr, Bohr's model, a Danish physicist. In 1913, a student of Rutherford revised Rutherford's model by proposing that the electrons are arranged in concentric circular orbits around the nucleus, just like the planets orbiting the sun. Hence, Bohr's model is also called planetary model. Electrons occupy only certain stable orbits around the nucleus. That's a stable orbit, that's a stable orbit, that's a stable orbit. In between is not stable. These orbits are called stationary orbits. Each orbit has an energy associated with it and at a specific distance from the nucleus. That's the nucleus, distance, distance, distance. The orbit nearest to the nucleus has an energy E1 and the next orbit from the nucleus has an energy E2 and E3 and goes on. So what could be wrong with Rutherford's model? Well, the electrons could collapse into the nucleus because they'll be attracted into the nucleus and then they will just disappear into the nucleus, but that didn't happen. So that means something else is happening. Bohr's model is widely accepted. When an electron absorbed the right amount of energy, in this case photon, so that's the photon, that's the electron absorbed in the photon, it will jump from a lower orbit E2 to a higher orbit E3. So this energy absorbed will give the electron the energy to jump from a lower energy level here to a higher energy level. So that's called excitation. So the electron gets excited. So the absorption led to excitation. But the electron will not stay long in the higher energy level. Soon it will jump back down from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. In doing so, it will release an energy or light and this is called emission of light. So this is an emission process. And the energy of light emitted or absorbed can be calculated by using the difference between the two orbital energies. So this is the difference between the two orbital energy. In this case, E3 minus E2 will be equal to HF, where H is Planck constant and F is the frequency. After that, Ernest Rutherford then discovered proton. Proton was discovered in 1919 by Rutherford. For decades, proton was considered to be elementary particle, just like electron. But after that, it discovered that proton wasn't an elementary particle, but rather proton is a composite particle because it consists of quarks. 
The 11th person to talk about is Owen Strongham, Austrian Irish physicist in 1926, quantum model. A powerful model of the atom was developed by Erwin Schrodinger in 1926. He combined the equation of the behavior of waves with the de Broglie equation to generate a mathematical model for the distribution of electrons in an atom. Schrodinger model assumed that the electrons is a wave and tried to describe the region in space or orbits where electrons are most likely to be found. Instead of trying to tell us where the electron is at at any time, the Bohr model, the Schrodinger model describes the probability that an electron can be found in a given region or space at a given time. This model no longer tells us where the electron is, but rather it only tells us where it may be. The Bohr model was a one-dimensional model that tells us where electron will be and that the electron orbits the nucleus. So Bohr model is telling us that the electron orbits the nucleus. Schrodinger model tells us that electrons have orbitals rather than orbits. So they are not orbiting the nucleus, but they have orbitals, which allows the electron to occupy three-dimensional space. It therefore requires three coordinates or three quantum numbers to describe the orbitals in which electrons can be found. The three coordinates that comes from Schrodinger wave equations are the principal n, angular l, and magnetic m quantum numbers. This is the time-independent Schrodinger equation where h with a hat is the Hamiltonian as the total energy is the kinetic energy plus potential energy. Psi is the wave function and which gives the energy and the wave function. So this is what we call time independent Schrodinger equation. These quantum numbers describe the size, shape and orientation in space of the orbitals of an atom. We have the S which stands for sharp which means the electron goes around in a wave in a circular wave. And we have P, which is called principal, and that is like a dumbbell shape. We have D, which is diffusion, and we have F, which is fundamental, and G, H, and it goes on alphabetically. The D orbital, we have D, X, Y, that means X, Y plane. So you got a, a P orbital in X, Y plane, in X, Y plane, because that's Y and X. D, X squared, Y squared, it's on the axis of y and x. It's on the axis of x and y. Same thing for xz. That is talking about xz plane. So in between. That's what that meant. xz plane. And here is the dx squared minus z squared. That means it's the axis of z and axis of x. This is dyz. So this is y and that is z. Again, between y and z axis. And we go the dy squared minus z squared. Again, this is z axis and y axis. So if I could write that there, that would be z and y axis. x squared minus z squared and y squared minus z squared combine together to then form the z squared d orbital. And so Instead of having six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, we only have five because these two combine to form this. So you can see that and that are in that plane. This is X plane here, and there's the X, and this is a Y plane here, and this is a Z plane. So those ones are forming like a donut, and you've got a P orbital inside the donut. So like the Bohr model, instead of having a concentric circle, electron orbiting the nucleus, in the quantum model, the electrons are not orbiting the nucleus, but they form a shape around the nucleus, different shape, S shape, P shape, D shape, F shape. So they're quite different. And these shapes can be obtained by mathematical calculations. So unlike Bohr model, Bohr model says that the electron orbits the nucleus. Quantum model tells us that electron doesn't orbit the nucleus, but rather it has orbitals. And these are the orbitals here. S orbital, P orbital, and D orbitals. So there's one S orbital. There are three 
POB2. This is PY, there's PZ and PX as well. So same shape, but line in the Y direction, that shape also in the X direction, and that shape in the Z direction. So there are three of them. And the DOB2 has five. One, two, three, four, five. And so these are the orbitals rather than the uh, normal circle orbits that we get with Bohr model. The last person to look at is Sir James Chadwick. In is an English physicist, and in 1932, uh, Chadwick discovered neutron. And Chadwick used a version of Rutherford experiment using a sheet of beryllium and a paraffin block instead of gold foil. He was able to depict that a proton-sized neutral particle now called a neutron does exist. This is the Sir Ernest Rutherford's laboratory that Sir James Chadwick also used. This is the Bohr model that we use to simplify the description of atomic model of an element. So we looking at, in this case, I'm looking at an element of sodium. So if I write sodium here, sodium. Sodium has atomic mass of 23 and atomic number of 11. Atomic mass is the number of protons plus neutrons. And the atomic number is the number of protons. I mean, the proton here is plus 11 and the electron is minus 11. And if I take away the protons from the atomic mass, I get the neutrons. So that's 12 neutrons. And we could write the electron configuration of the sodium element. But first, let's populate the, the shells, the energy levels here. And so the first electron goes into here and the second electron goes there. And so that means that the electron configuration is 2 for the first energy level. And, the, and then we go on to second energy level by populating it with 8 electrons. So we do the first 4 first like that, spaced apart, and then we start to pair it like that. And so that's comma, and then we do eight. And then the final electron, because we got 11 electrons, so the final electrons, we go in here. And so that's one. And we do call this shell, this one is the K shell, and that's the L and M shell. So this is the Bohr model. So it's quite simple. And the outer shell here is what we call the valence shell. And the electron in the valence shell, we call that valence electron. So there's the one that is responsible for the property of the element of sodium. Because these electrons are the ones involved in the chemical reactions. Not these ones, but the ones in the outer shells. So that's a good description there. But we could also show the quantum model. So if I show the quantum model, so that's quantum model and in this case we have 1s2 and 2s2 and 2p6 and 3x1 and in this case we have the s 1s orbital which is smaller than 2s orbital and 2s orbital is smaller than 3s orbital we got the p orbital here there are 3p orbitals here 3x uh, that's px py and pz and because an orbital can only take a maximum of two electrons. So there have to be three orbitals here. And so that's the quantum model here.